Welcome to the Keen on Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Keenon Yoga podcast is Gregor Maley. Greg is the international author of five textbooks covering all eight limbs of yoga. He began his practice of Hatha Yoga around 1980, traveling to India to study with various yogic and tantric masters. After practicing with BKS Iyengar for 14 months, he traveled to Mysore, India, and was finally authorized in 1997 to teach traditional Ashtanga Yoga by Patabi Joyce. In India, Gregor also received eight months of mainly one-to-one tuition on yogic scriptures by B.N.S. Iyengar. Together with his wife Monica, in 1996, they founded the Eight Limb School of Yoga in Perth, Australia. Gregor is internationally acclaimed as the textbook series author, consisting of the books Ashtanga Yoga, Practice and Philosophy, and Ashtanga Yoga, the Intimate Intermediate Series. He has sold more than 85,000 copies worldwide, and his book has been translated into more than eight foreign languages. He teaches what he calls an anatomically sophisticated interpretation of the tradition, as well as one integrated into the practice of the higher limbs in the true spirit of Patanjali. Welcome to the Kino Yoga podcast, Gregor. Thanks so much, Adam. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Lovely to have you. So, um, how did you start yoga? I mean, I said a bit of that, but I'd like to hear it from the horse's mouth. <laughs> okay. Um, look, um, I've always, yeah, I, I sort of had a strange uh, childhood in that regard that I was always interested in spirituality mm. and basically started reading spirituality from an early age onwards. And I came across the Yoga Sutra and the Upanishads when I was 15 years old. Mm. It looked like an accident at the time. Now, of course, it doesn't look like an accident anymore. Mm. And, um, yeah. Where so did you find them? I, um, basically, people knew that um, I was reading weird stuff and people were giving me weird books that nobody else read. For example, my sister, who is younger than me, she gave me a complete um, a copy of the Pali Canon, the teachings of the Buddha, when I was 12 years old. People knew that I was into weird stuff. And so all of that piled up, yeah? And so, that's yeah, that's... really how, unusual, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so people gave me copies of the Yoga Sutra and yeah. of the Upanishads because that was stuff that was lying around on people's bookshelf and nobody knew what to do with it, they said, okay, here, you take it. So, yeah, those copies found their way to me. And they just weren't around. And, I mean, I don't think they would have been around in the UK. <laughs> I, um, I would have loved to have um, had them there, turn there up. Probably some archive copies, you know, like, you know, the, a lot of the Vedas, etc., cetera, um, got translated by Max Müller into English mm. in, you know, like 100 years ago. So... Yeah, mm. there would have been some very arcane copies, you know, with very heavy Victorian English. Right, so you got the you got those books, and then uh, yes, that's just... right. And and then I was, uh, and yeah, I was totally like, um, "Hooray, that's it! What I want to devote my devote my life yeah. to," you know, and and right. mainly because it was so totally weird. Yeah, so imagine a fifteen year old. Um, you know, coming from a post-industrial society, reading yeah. the Upanishads. And I thought, wow, I want to devote my life to that. And then, well, you know, yoga in those days was very, very basic. Yeah, it was basically just some TAFE courses and 
you know, mm, mm, we did yoga together with old ladies who were... Yeah, know, that was my experience, yeah. yeah. High-cut <laughs> le- leotards, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, it was pretty weird, yeah. Yeah. As a young and you were in the age. class as well as a, as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you felt <laughs> totally out of same. place. Yeah, yeah. Totally out of place as a young yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. And But look, you know, I sort of... I, I figured out very early that I needed to travel to India. So, and I rocked up in India when I was basically 20 years old. So, and mm. sort of took off from there. Did you study or did you not go to university? Yes, yes. I, I went to university and I studied uh, history first and I studied comparative religion mm. and I studied philosophy at university. Yeah. Right. But mm. I, I didn't see those course, courses through to the end because they were so theoretical, you know, it was sort of like you always studied somebody else's thoughts and, yeah. and it wasn't like set up in a way that it was transfor- supposed to transform you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Very similar to my background. I had the philosophy experience as well. It was like just words, isn't it? If they haven't got mm. any meaning or reason behind trying to study mm. words, then it's just mm. semantics. Um, mm. So when you went to India at twenty, it was when and I, nine, you're not that old, but probably the nineteen eighties, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. It, I uh, um, arrived in uh, in nineteen eighty four, the first time in India. Yeah. What was that like? Um, it was absolutely amazing. You know, like I, I imagine. So when I came the first time to India, you know, it was really like I booked my flight ticket. Yeah. Yeah. And I made as much money. I was working in this big factory, which was a paper mill. Yeah. With giant machines, you know, with sort of 100 meters long and hammering in the night. And it was dirty and smelly. And I, I worked always night shift to make more money. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so in this sort of, sort of almost like an apocalyptic setting, yeah. Um, worked until the last day, you know, packed my, my little bag, jumped on the flight, yeah, and out came, I came at uh, uh, Mumbai, which was Bombay back yeah. then, yeah. walked yeah. out of the airport, yeah. and there was one of the old hippie buses who, uh, this guy had just dropped off a bunch of hippies at the airport, and I said, oh, where are you going? And he said to me, I'm going to... Humpy, and I said, can you give me a lift, yeah? And he said, yeah, yeah, come along. So I hopped into this bus, and then we drove some 18 hours to Humpy. And he didn't go exactly to the end, to the so-called Humpy Bazaar, but um, I got out of the bus and then hitchhiked and Mm. ended up in Humpy Bazaar. And, you know, in 1984, you, you walked from... Hampi Bazaar. So Hampi is the former um, capital of, of the kingdom Vijayanagar, which was abandoned in 1750 around the time. Like Vijayanagar traded with Vasco da Gama, yeah, who was the first European, you know, who, who arrived there, yeah, or yeah. was the first anyway, Portuguese yeah. um, colony. And um, yeah, you know, the city was abandoned. And so I ended up sleeping in this old temple, which was an abandoned temple, and I set up a hammock, yeah? And so in this giant ruin field, which looked and felt like the ruined city in uh, in Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book, yeah? I remember yeah. the monkey yeah. and Bagheera yeah. the bear and Bagheera the panther. It was exactly like that. So I was surrounded by monkeys. You could hear the tiger roaring in the night. And in this giant ruined city that looked like a jungle book, only just a little bit dry or not, not quite as lush, there were about, um, you know, maybe a hundred uh, Hindu ascetics, so-called sadhus, yeah, and a bunch of hippies and me. Sort of, that was sort of, for, for me, like coming out of an industrial yeah. society. What a contrast. At age 20. Yeah, yeah. I still, I'm so glad that I experienced that because it was stepping back a thousand years. Mm, 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 mm. What did you it think was, of it? I mean, what were your feelings at that time? What, what, yeah, what was your original assessment of, of the experience Well, I thought having? I had ended up in heaven, 
Yeah. I would have, yeah. Yeah. hang out with with Hindu ascetics yeah. at that point in my life yeah. was the coolest I could imagine, you know? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Mm. Then, I mean, well, did they teach yoga or how did you start to get into, you know, studying the scriptures and the, the yoga? Where, how did that, tell us a bit more about how that journey unfolded. Well, you know, I was always uh, right from the beginning really into scriptures. So for me, it was mm. like, Okay, reading the Upanishads, you know, the, that's the descriptions of the states that you want to achieve. Then I found the Yoga Sutra. Okay, this is how you do it. But hey, I haven't got a clue. How do you do it? Yeah. And so I did some dodgy asana classes. <laughs> but they were pretty, pretty uncool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, then, you know, those sadhus, you know, of course, they were doing some asanas and they were doing... Yeah some breathing techniques and they were doing some other stuff that yeah and and so it started from there yeah and so but, you copy them or did they teach you or? yeah yeah i copied them yeah 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 right. i copied them yeah and yeah and there were a lot of things that i didn't copy that were sort of very unsavory yeah really um yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they have a lot of bizarre practices. Yeah. Right. Mm. Huh. And so um, you saw kind of some kind of left hand tantra going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And um, yeah, so yeah, and th- that was the beginning. And it was yeah. an amazing beginning in that regard that I was sort of introduced to this living culture, you know, so I think now it would be much more difficult, yeah, because, you know, like in those early days in India, I lived in a thatched roof hut with a cowshed floor, yeah, Mm, mm. so for our listeners, you know, the way how you do it in rural India in these days, you take cow dung, which was really easy because I was sharing the hut with a buffalo, a real life buffalo, yeah? Right. And it's really hard to sleep next to a buffalo because they're huge and they're burping and farting all night long. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Mm. And but anyway, you know, you mix the cow dung with clay and then yeah. you spread it. Oh, on you the mix it. I didn't realise you mixed it with clay. I thought you just water spread it on its own without nothing. No, no, and then no, no. Bake. water and with... clay, mix it. Okay. Spread and then it, it bakes and it hard. An, yeah. Yeah. And it forms an uh, uh, an antiseptic. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's antiseptic floor, and you do your yoga on there, and that's what the sadhus. The How Hindu often do you make it again? Uh, it it cracks up eventually, so maybe every week. Oh, really? Once a week? Okay. Depending on Not how every day. You use it. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it sounds like hard work. The things you yeah, learn in um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Doing a, a yoga podcast. Um, yeah. Right. So after that, you you got into tantra, or you went to Pune with B- BKS Iyengar, or how, how did that? Yes. Unfold? Yeah. 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 Um, I went to uh, BKS Iyengar, and it was sort of quite funny because I went to the Osho Ashram at the same time. Oh right. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it was really bizarre because I had to keep it secret on both sides. Yeah. Right. So neither of them were allowed because they right. both hated each other. Yeah. Right? So early in the morning, I like, you know, uh, at the crack of dawn, I jumped on my scooter, drove across Pune to do my classes with BKS Ayenga. And then later I drove back to the, to the Osho Ashram. Yeah. You were staying there yeah. in the Osho Ashram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, well Osho was, would have been live then, right? Yes, yes, he was. Yeah. Right. So well, were you allowed to, I, at that time, I don't think you were even allowed to look at him anymore, right? Or... Pardon? I, at that time, by that time in his life, I don't know whether you were even now able to look at him anymore. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. were some. I had some kind funny of got stories. A bit weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, it was quite bizarre because it was already huge. You know, like there were sometimes yeah. thousands of people in the in the in in the hall where he held his talks, etc. Yeah, mm. this was very bizarre. But I, I think everybody has seen Wild Wild Country, so we don't have to go into great detail. What, what sort of stories went on there? It was quite a bizarre yeah, cult. Yeah, oh, right, okay. The, yeah, it was, the a, very, it was a very bizarre yeah, cult, yeah. but it was yeah. interesting to get into that at that age. Well, I think I heard on another podcast you did, you say you kind of a, a 
like a serial uh, cult joiner. You, you joined six right. cults or something. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> what, yes, which, yeah. other, which other ones did you join? Well, did you, you know, learn I your was... lesson after the first one? No, no, I wasn't. No, no, you can't <laughs> because, read on. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. hard, I'm, I'm difficult, I'm a slow learner, you know, I had to repeat the situation <laughs> yeah. a couple of times. Well, yeah. I was in a, in, a, in a few Buddhist cults as well, you right. know, where the situation was quite similar. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so with power dynamics, you know, manipulation, mm. etc. Mm. you know, mm. so seems to repeat itself in spiritual groups, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think it's not the nature of any power structure to be a little bit, I mean, if we define cult as a kind of sense of, you know, kind of manipulation of a, of a, of a number of people, mm. any, stru- any structure to a degree kind of falls into that category, perhaps. Yes, it's, it's a very difficult term to, to define cult. Mm. Yeah? But I think what's really important is that there are some mysterious powers bestowed on the authority figure. Right. Yeah? And that right. the authority figure is not to be questioned, and that the authority figure are the teaching instead of relaying the teaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So whenever yeah. you so see get, that, yeah. I think then it's time to run quickly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we may come back to that a little bit later, but yeah, yes. I like what you say about yeah, the idea of the method should stand yeah. testament to itself, you know, in and yes. of itself, rather than be yeah. kind of vouched or authorized by a teacher who's simply the authority. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, behind the method. Um, and on that subject, um, <laughs> you arrived in Mysore. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, and and how did you uh, meet Patabi Joyce and get into the Ashtanga Yoga? When when was that? You got authorized in 97, well, so... Yeah, I actually came to Mysore for the first time in 1984. And again, I was, you know, I don't know whether you remember, but there was Chamundi Hill outside of Mysore. yeah. yeah. And there is halfway up Chamundi Hill is a cave in which a sadhu lived, yeah? So, and I hung out mainly with that sadhu. And um, that was the old sadhu, you know, so he wasn't there when I came back in the 1990s. And they were telling me that there was a, a, a yoga teacher um, in Mysore. And, and I, I listened a bit about what he taught, but it sounded too bizarre, you know, like, the, you know, the intense asana practice. Right. And so I didn't go at the time and I went only back in 1995. And that's when I went straight to Patavi Joyce and I started with him. So that's 10 years later. What, what changed in the interim that made you kind of fancy a little bit more gymnastics? Yeah, there was a, a huge change. And that was when I went to India first, I was um, interested in instant enlightenment. Yeah. And I was basically checking teachers whether they were promising me that I, whether I could um, reach, you know, spiritual liberation, or whatever you want to call it, within mm. two years. That was the maximum I was two years, ready to. Right. Two years. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. There were actually some that sure promised it people, in two yeah. weeks. In two oh, weeks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's how much I was prepared to right. invest. Yeah, and I thought, well, shortcut, you know, let's cut, cut the bullshit and go straight to the heart of the matter. And so I did that for many years. And so the only thing that happened is that my body wore out. <clears throat> Yeah, my body wore out, you know. I was like, I remember having, I, I have some photos of mine somewhere where I was 25 years old and I look older than I am now. Yeah. What were you doing to make you so tired? Um, you know, like I had pretty much any, every tropical disease in the book. Right, so you just went, I yeah. mean, you were traveling a lot around India or did you go back home? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, you both, both, you know. Right. Usually I went every year to India maybe for three right. to six months. Right. And I was trekking over the Himalayas and, you know, in various places, but very, very basic. You know, I was always mainly living in, in basic huts and right. drinking from open wells and drinking from open streams <laughs> and, and basically always eating the food and the drink of the locals. You know, I was sort right. of like, you know, I'm invincible, you know, sort of stupid young male, so to say, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, it just really got to me. I got really, really unhealthy. I got down to eighty-five. Uh, sorry, forty-eight kilos 
And you're yeah, probably six so, foot, right? I mean, you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm six yeah. foot. Yeah, 48 kilos. And I'm usually like, hey, 75 kilos would be my standard weight. So I've been down to right. 48. And yeah, got really, really unhealthy. And yeah, probably also a bit cuckoo, you know. Yeah. I was going to say, what yeah. was your mental state like at that time? I mean, that's uh, My years, mental I mean, state was yeah. um, I, I had this particular spiritual practice when I was up in the Himalayas instead of eating at sunrise, I would climb up on the next peak, like 3,000 or 3,500 meters. I got stripped myself naked and uh, I greeted the rising sun and I screamed, Shiva! And that was the technique to take solar power into my organism. And I don't know, I somehow got the idea you could work live from solar mm. power i mean there's even still people today advertising that but it didn't quite work in my case so yeah anyway they, they were sort yeah. of the early years you know mm -hmm. like, like, it I'm does sound hard really. because i mean yeah you were going back home and i guess just working for a bit of money and then going back again you know that's how it was, was completely outside society but hadn't really totally. found a yeah, yeah like a firm basis of something else yeah. either right yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. and you know there was back in those days I don't know whether it's still like that, but there were lots of young people like me traveling mm. through India, very confused. Mm. Yeah, And there were also lots of people pandering for that and, and teaching you all sort of nonsense, you know, recruiting followers and creating more confusion in them, you know. So I've seen a lot of craziness in those days, you know. Yeah. And then what changed to make you finally go to Mysore? Um, I met somebody that was in Goa who I was talking about Ashtanga yoga at the time, yeah, which for me was Patanjali yoga, you know, as you know, mm -hmm. Sutra uh, 228, Ashtau Angani, these are the eight limbs, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then he says, oh, I know this guy who's teaching Ashtanga yoga. And I said, oh, really? And um, yeah, and, I, and he said, yeah, yeah, you have to go to Mysore. His name is Patavi Joyce. So. I went to Patabi Joyce, said to him, so you're teaching Ashtanga yoga? And he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, this is based on the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali. He says, yes, yes, you do. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's how it happened, you know? We were a bit surprised at first that it wasn't really a, a full um, overview of the eight limbs. Uh, I think at that point, I was really ready to do a full-on physical practice. Right, right. I was really ready. Um, just because I had done so much abstract, abstract stuff, you know, a lot of meditation techniques, you know, back then I had already like worked through the meditation techniques in the Vignana Bhairava Tantra, um, you know, Buddhist meditation techniques, of mm -hmm. course, and mm -hmm. mantra meditation, you name it. I've practiced all of that for years and years, but I felt that there was no connection to the body. My body was rapidly breaking down. And I was really ready for some intense physical practice. So you weren't yeah. in good health when you when you first went there. I wasn't in good health. Mm -mm. No. And you had some. I think I kind of read a lot of recent things you wrote. You you didn't. It was a tough experience that you had, right? I think you kind of got some knee injuries and um, and some kind of rather tough love in uh, in Badakanasana. I remember. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah that, I um. I used to stay in this hotel in the second floor, Carvery Hotel, where back then a lot of the yoga students yeah. stayed when mm -hmm. the Shala was still in Lakshmi Puram. And I had to walk up to the second floor where my room was. And it was always like um, there were two phases to the day. Phase one, fear building up to Bharakonasana. And then phase number two, the pain resulting from Bharakonasana, yeah. So right. I got pretty much stood on mm, in mm. Bharakonasana, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I hardly could walk, you know. So stood on was, your knees? Yeah, yeah, on the inside of my thighs, yes. Every day? <clears throat> yeah. Well, did that work? Um, you know, I think it didn't work. It didn't work, no. Um Somehow, you know, I remember, so I met Monica, my wife, in, mm. in Mysore, and mm -hmm. she was right the opposite. She said to me, 
she was sort of like this person she could just let go yeah and so she, one day she asked me what are you actually doing in Parakonasana? <laughs> I said to her, I'm fighting back as hard as I can. <laughs> well, I didn't want to have my leg, my hips, right, okay. my, yeah, my, yeah. my 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 uh, adductors mm. ripped off the bone. Yeah, but you know, I tried to let go, and it was just too intense. And probably the thing is also, yeah, my body is not the best when it comes to letting go. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think that was so, the thing that people said that, oh, if you let just let go, that's the only way to protect yourself at the time when the adjustments were quite firm, you know? Yeah. The only thing yeah, you, well, you could do was let go to them and, and you didn't manage to uh, do that. So, well, that's, <laughs> that backfired for a lot of people yeah. too. Well, of course as well, yeah. L- yeah. Letting go, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. the letting go, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people got adductor injuries or hamstring right. injuries and forward mm-hmm. bending, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But for me, Barakonasana, to jump ahead, is uh, it's, it was really the understanding of anatomy that right. saved me, yeah? Because at some point I thought, this is totally crazy here. Month after month, I'm being stood on, you know? Mm-hmm. And the increase in flexibility wasn't really worth the pain. It wasn't. Right. Right. Yeah? And mm-hmm. so I started to think, well, what do I actually have to do? And sort of the breakthrough for me was really to actually understand. Uh, um, now, let me just think. Um, okay, I had done prior to that in, uh, in the Pune Ashram, uh, a so-called rebalancing training, which is based on rolfing. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, it's yeah. basically rolfing, similar... Yeah. Yeah, Royal thing. That's where basically yeah. comes from. So I knew about deep tissue body work and I'd studied anatomy. And then I went on from there and did sort of like a whole, what was called a health practitioner license, where you had to study anatomy and you had to study physiology and, and a couple more things. And sort of, I, I really knew when I started full on Ashtanga yoga, I knew all of my anatomy. I knew right. all the muscles in the body, in insertion. Right. And, the origin, I get. I knew yeah, all of the that's a, muscle, uh, that's a good the bones. I knew all of the bones by name and where exactly mm. the insertion was. And then I was sort of I started to simulate it in my head. You know, we didn't have apps then that simulate all of that. Yeah, and I tried to simulate it in my head. What the hell do I have to do here? Yeah, and I could actually visualize when I was doing the posture where the origin of the muscle was. Right. Mm-hmm. And how did its position change if I internally yeah. rotated the legs, for I think, example? And let's be clear, I mean, to be quite honest, now that doesn't seem like that big a deal because there's yoga anatomy everywhere. But when mm. I first got my hands on your book, mm. and, you know, like previous to your book, bizarrely enough, it now, like to say now, is like that was incomprehensible, really. Like, I don't think... I, it it totally any, was. No one thought of, like, what you were doing no. there anatomically. It was just no. like, are you doing it or you're not? Like, you know, like, yeah. is, your chin on, is your chin on the floor and your knees on the floor? Yeah. Or isn't it? It wasn't like, yeah. well, the anatomy, like, this is rolling this way and this is... So mm. that's how you came up with your, your book, which was anatomy-based, yes. which was like a yes. first, really, through yeah. that background. Yeah. Right. Exactly, right. exactly. And right. because I had to do that, it didn't work any other, yeah? You know, it didn't work any other. For example, when I started Ashtanga, I came up with really bad wrist injuries and right. shoulder injuries. And I was starting to think, you know, what is happening? And I was trying out different neck movements, right. for example. Mm-hmm. And I understood that, aha, it is because the nerves um, that innovate your wrists are coming out from c7 i could see them because i knew i'd studied that. that's where they are so let's try really lengthening that area and the pain disappeared that's how i learned all of that stuff to apply it you know because i had a lot of problems when i started you know and that's so- incredible and i think it's worth bearing in mind as well then that i think people assume that you're going to be have to be really the best teacher is the best practitioner and it's often not the case i mean I don't know about you, but I never thought I was the best practitioner. But I, with the difficulties, often comes the quality of the teaching, right? I mean, the fact yeah. that you had those yeah. challenges make you know mm-hmm. it's not like someone who can just do it because often the people that can just do it don't really know why they're doing it or how they're doing it. You know, they usually can't. They usually can't. They usually right. can't understand. Let's say a person that is super flexible, and mm-hmm. you know, you just tell them 
do buddhasana and you explain it how to do it and they can do yeah. it they can't explain somebody who is as stiff as if they would have a swallowed a surfboard yeah <laughs> they can't explain to a person like that how to do the posture because they haven't gone the path to get there yeah mm -mm -mm. so you know when i i studied when i started to train teachers um i assumed that it's the most talented people in yoga yeah. that will become the best teachers. That yeah. was never the yeah. case. No, no, quite. Sometimes the opposite, in fact. Yes, yeah. Usually the opposite. The people yeah. who have the most problems are the mm, best mm, 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 mm. teachers. Yeah. Yeah, that's mm. the thing about pain. It make, makes you think. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. So... What do you appreciate about the tradition then? I mean, do you agree with uh, going through the tradition linearly? So you come to Badakanasa, uh, you know, after you've done the rest, or is there other hip opening stuff that you should do before Badakanasa? Like, what do you think about the sequence then in terms of how you teach it then to facilitate something like Badakanasa? Because for many people with stiff hips, they'd never get towards Badakanasa, right? Mm -hmm. um, look, let me say a little bit about something about tr tradition generally. Um, I don't accept the term traditional for um, you can't change the sequence. Yeah? No. You, you yes. know how there is a bit like who, is, who, who sticks to the sequence no, ever, no, no matter what is traditional and who alters it, yeah. they are non-traditional. I, yeah. I don't accept that terminology. I actually use the the term orthodoxy when it comes to right. people who who are really really rigid yeah so because the thing is you know if you have taught for a long time you know that for the majority of your students that's not possible mm -hmm. yeah the majority of the people who come in if you tell them you have to do marichyasana d before you do any other posture afterwards the statistical likelihood that they're going to injure their knees and then go on to another style of yoga is very, yeah. very high. Yeah? Yeah. You have maybe 10% of all students who come in, they can do it exactly in that order. Yeah? yeah. So for me, I'm sort of looking more at the primary series as having three, let's call them tranches. Yeah? It's like as if like a tranche, like if you um, horizontally cut through the sequence, you're creating three different layers. Right, okay, yeah. Superimpose. Mm -hmm. And in the first layer is something that I would teach in a beginner's course, level one. Right. Yeah. And in the second layer... How does that look beginner, like? Um, it's What's most of the like? standing postures. Right. But amongst the sitting postures, it would be just um, Paschimottanasana, Purvottanasana, uh, Marajasana A and B. Um, right. So B goes um, in there as well, even though it's got the lotus in. Mar Sorry, not Marashyasana, Janushasana A and B. Yeah, right. Marashyasana A and C. Yeah. And uh, Navasana and yeah. uh, maybe Barakonasana. That's it. Yeah. yeah? Exactly, and then, exactly what I would do. Yeah. 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 yeah and then, and then yeah. with, the, with, with in, in the second beginner's course, you can start filling in postures that are a bit more difficult. Yeah. And the third layer, I teach only in a Meister style class, yeah, because there is just postures. You can't really talk them through to a beginner. Mm. You need to take time. Okay, let's see whether we can get you mm -hmm. into Kormasana or something like that. You know, you don't want to talk to class at all. I mean, just as a kind of slight diversion for a second, what, in your view, is all the stuff with the knees? I mean, it's a, like ostensibly, superficially anyway, it's a system of exercise or a system of moving the body anyway. But it's got so much stuff with this, the knees. And obviously for a lot of people in the West, this is a real challenge. Why so much stuff with the lotus? Look, I wrote that in my first book, and that is that um, the primary series is really comes out of a culture where people sitting on the floor. Yeah. And mm. if you sit on the floor all life long, your knees are on the floor when you sit on the floor and you can do all of that, yeah? 
So that means if we translate that into a culture where people sit on chairs, they will obviously have tight hips and short adductors. Yeah? That means you have to modify the series until their hip joints and adductors have opened up to an extent that they can do it. Yeah. Now, the reason why primary series is what it is, is because the number one and most important posture is Padmasana. Mm, mm. But why is that? Why? Okay. Mm. All right. What are then the reasons? What is the benefit Padmasana? of having super open hips? That, that's the, you know, the deeper question well, behind it as well, right? Like, so, is there some kind know, of let's, psychic let's, benefit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are psychic mm. benefits. And mm. so, you know, when, when I started uh, to do Ashtanga Yoga, I was so stiff, like I couldn't breathe when I went into Padmasana. I couldn't breathe. That's how much pain I had. And now 40 years later, I can sit in Padmasana if I have to all day long. Yeah. So I would never sit, do a 10-day, 10 10-hour 10 sitting. But I sit for 45 minutes in Padmasana go up, do slow meditative walking like the Buddhists do for five minutes, sit back down another 45 minutes, Padmasana. And then I may do it like that for 10 hours if I have to. Yeah. Now, the thing is, um, in my Panayama practice, for example, <clears throat> if I can't sit for whatever reason in Padmasana, I had a period uh, maybe 10 years ago where... Uh, I pulled my meniscus slightly and, you know, mm. that healed in eight months. But for eight months, I couldn't do Padmasana. Mm -mm. My pranayama went seriously backwards. Really? Yeah? So there's something so, about the lotus. That is, totally. And that is right. because your pranic retention rate goes down, your breath count goes down, <clears throat> your kumbhakas goes down, go, go down. I would say <clears throat> I had to reduce all of that by about, hell, 25%. Can you suggest what it is about that physical position that affects yes. the energy so much? Yeah, mm. totally, I can. And so, you know, when you are in a, <clears throat> in a meditation or pranayama position, yeah, whenever you do powerful, subtle work, raising the kundalini, awakening the chakras, entering samadhi, doing kumbhakas, any of that stuff, you, you need to fo follow the, the following. Your palms... And your hands, sorry, your, your palms and your soles of your feet have to be turned up to the heaven, yeah? Because they are receivers. You right. can't do those practices sitting on the chair with your soles of the feet facing down into the floor because all of your pranic energy goes down into the earth, which is a receiver. All of that needs to be turned up, yeah? Soles and palms turned up to, towards heaven, yeah? Right. Mm -hmm. Then. Mm -hmm. Um, you are ideally, so your perineum needs to pre press into the floor to stimulate Mula Bandha. Mm -hmm. That means your pelvis needs to be radically tilted forward. Mm -hmm. Your spine needs to have the shape of a double S curve that is exactly the same as if you were standing. So if you look at somebody when they are standing from the side, you can see that they have quite a low doses. You need to emulate that when you're, step, when you're sitting so that the perineum can press into the floor. And only in this double S curve can actually the kundalini be stimulated to go up. Yeah? Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. now when you look at a sitting position in which you tilt your pelvis that far forward, it means that the sacrum has to be nutated. Now, when you nutate the sacrum, what do you have to do? The nutation of the sacrum will always be accommodated by an internal rotation of the thigh bones. By Just define that term, nutation, for people that don't know. Okay, so nutation mm -hmm. is a movement that comes from uh, astronomy. It's a movement of the Earth axis, which wobbles slightly as the Earth rotates. Yeah, right. And so mm -hmm. the Earth rotates around the sun like that but it actually wobbles slightly like that, yeah? And this wobble creates the platonic year, yeah? Right, yeah. And so um, that movement is, has, it's a movement is called nutation, 
which yeah. means like it's a bowing movement, yeah? yeah? And so the sacrum, let's just say for ease, or let's just go like that. The sacrum is about shaped like this. Let's say this is the promontory of the sacrum. Down, you know, actually, let's shape, let's say like this, promontory of the sacrum, this dimple here we call Brahma Guha, that is the cave of Brahman. This is the coccyx, yeah? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Now, the sacrum has to actually perform that movement when it floats into your SI joints, and it does that to pump CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, yeah? And your brain goes swoosh, 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 and all of the cranial bones move. And this has to all function for you to enter like some form of cosmic consciousness transformational experience, yeah? Right. You, you can't have like that hand movement sit, there. He, sitting like this, yeah? You can't do it with your back rounded. Yeah? It's a you very precise to, tilting of the, of the coccyx. Totally precise, yeah. totally precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you go into samadhi, you can actually adjust your samadhi by tilting the pelvis more forward. Right. And if it's not tilted enough forward, you'll fall out of the samadhi, yeah? So there's something That's very precise it is. specific then about this totally. system, which I previous term is totally. exercise, because it's doing yeah. something very different to the yes. lower, the, this very yeah. subtle area of energy in the Absolutely. Of the and so, right. you know, what, what happens down at the sacrum is reverberated in your cranial bones. Yeah. Yeah. So right. what, what happens at the bottom end of the spine will always express itself up here. So your right. brain can't actually work as a receiver for cosmic consciousness when your pelvis is not properly adjusted. Yeah. So that means you need to internally rotate your thigh bones. You need to draw your sit bones out to the side like that. And you need to tilt your anterior superior iliac spines, the bony bit at the front yeah, of the yeah, hip, yeah, yeah, the yeah, ASSs. Yeah. You've got to yeah. tilt them backwards and towards each other. Yeah. Mysteriously, mysteriously, it's exactly the same bone movements which a woman performs in the final period of giving birth. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. there is a very deep correlation because. In Padmasana, you're giving birth to the new you, mm, to, mm, your, mm. to your inner divine child, to your higher self. Mm. It's a birthing process, yeah? So there's something in the method, and you're particular about this, that, that is kind of self-explanatory. You simply, the method holds its own authority. You practice oh, the method totally. correctly. Because I was going to ask you, and I kind of know the answer to this, is there anything relevant in the tradition, and I call it tradition in inverted commas, perhaps let's call it um, the current orthodoxy in Mysore, the idea that of, uh, I think I've heard you speak about this before, devotion and, you know, something else happening when you practice on a daily level and you have this relationship with the teacher. Is there anything else about that apart from simply the scientific aspect you were describing? Let's just take you. You, uh, you asked a lot of uh, different questions. Okay. Let's let's mm -hmm. take them sort of apart. Let's talk about the teacher first. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, <clears throat> we live in the so-called Kali Yuga now. Yeah. And mm. in the Kali Yuga, there is um, a, a tendency to. Uh, for corruption, yeah? And I think that, um, you know, when, when you have a baby, you will adore the baby, mm. yeah? But mm. if you express adoration to a grown-up, yeah? Mm. Um, sort of, you know, my wife doesn't adore me, you know? Like, I feel very much it's... <laughs> As a yeah, male, sure. it's really good to have a wife because she <laughs> yeah. basically um, tells you when you're full of shit, yeah? Yes, yes. You yeah. know, I think that's not um, an uncommon um, um, yes. relationship. <laughs> yeah. So, Experience. you know, I, I feel that when you are expressing adoration to a grown-up, you're actually infantilizing them. Right. Yeah? And so that is the problem that has sort of like crept into spirituality, that people really treat teachers 
as if they were infantile, yeah, as if they need this constant, you know, adoration. The teachers, yeah, the teachers aren't infantile, but the um, or the te- no, the student becomes the infant again, and they're looking for the parent. Is that- yeah, but also you infantilize the teacher, right, the, the guru, teacher by expressing okay. this amount of devotion as if they right, were a little right. child, you know. Yeah, okay. I don't need the devotion of a student, right. you know. Like, I like what you say about when they try and kiss your feet and you, you mm. kiss theirs. You kiss back their feet. Mm. Has that happened? Yeah. Has that happened many times to you? Uh, it has happened a couple of times. <laughs> it's the fastest way of getting people out of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's yeah. the fastest way of getting out of it. Yeah. You know, the the thing is, um, you know, let's put it like that. From a certain amount of knowledge, it's harder to not fall into the guru trap than to actually just follow it and go along with it, you know? It's like people want to have you as a guru. They want to project onto you that you have mystical powers, that you're raising your kundalini, that you're taking your negative karma away from them because they don't want to do the work yourself. So at some point, it's actually easier to just follow that and fulfill that expectation than constantly to be lecturing people it's your self-responsibility you know it's your sadhana that empowers you not devotion to a teacher yeah right Mm -hmm. you know we we believe monica and i believe that um devotion should be addressed to the divine and not to a human teacher right Mm -hmm. yeah you know even ramana ramana maharishi said the guru is never a body yeah because the guru is everywhere yeah, the it doesn't work infinite. having a symbol as a teacher to devote to. Yeah, yeah. It does, so that doesn't the, work. It's you can't limit the guru right. to a, a body that is sitting in front of you. That's not the real guru. That is a teacher that instructs you to do the technique properly, and hopefully they can correct you. Yeah, but you know the guru is the self. The guru is the divine. It's not a human being. Mm. Yeah. So. That's, that's the, and, and so the big problem is that is the psychological pro, process of projection, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it starts with the fact that we are living, so, sorry if I sort of like do a bit of a trajectory. In our industrial and post industrial society, the um, connection between mothers and infants has been cut from, a, from an earlier age onwards. Yeah. When you go into indi- orig- traditional indigenous societies, right. you will find that for the first few right. years, the mother will keep the baby permanently on the body. Yeah, that's true. Yeah? So you think we're yeah. looking for a parent, yes. generally? Yeah, absolutely. That's what mm-hmm. I'm saying, exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there is an interruption of the connection with the mother. I, I don't know whether babies are still born, but when I was born, it was like, Bright light. Yeah, I was luckily born at home. I actually don't fit into that bracket. But shortly after I was born, I was a home birth. Yeah, Shortly after I was born, they introduced this whole thing in the hospital, pull the baby up, neon lights, whack him on the bum. And there starts the trauma, you know? Yeah. Like indigenous people never do that. So an indigenous child grows up being completely smothered and assured for the first few years of its life yeah and then it doesn't have that need anymore to project do you think a lot of the kind of western craziness around the spiritual tradition let's say is a lot to do with birth trauma yes yeah with Mm. birth trauma and other forms of trauma of course as well uh, that we have lost our spirituality yeah and, you know, the, the whole neo-Darwinism, you know, that tells us that we, that we are a selfish gene-powered flesh robot, you know, and that we are surviving by competing against each other. My God, that messes you totally up. Yeah. Mm. And then, of course, you know, especially as white folks, we traveled around the world, like hammered all other cultures, destroyed them. How many million people have we killed across the world, you know, as a result of colonialism, etc. Mm. That's all trauma that is following us wherever we go. Mm. Totally. There's no kind of relevance in your mind of the idea that you can get out of your own habituated thinking by giving over to another person or another tradition as a symbol. 
So that gets too confused, does it? Um, no, I think that you are... Um, Still sharing I, I personally think. Uh, I personally think that transformation comes through sadhana, through the spiritual work that you're doing. And it's a method. It's a kriya, it's a method, a technique. Totally, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the place of the ego there, though? Because the, essentially, I was listening to your one of your podcasts yesterday, and then you're kind of mentioning the sutras and um, the the role of yoga in the sutras. And I was thinking, well, the sutras is essentially a manifesto for showing you that the ego is a superficial construct, right? But sometimes, yes. when you when you're thinking of the technique, it can make you more kind of um, crystallized in yourself in a way. You know, and often when I've told people about technique, I find that their practice is a lot more introverted and, and self reflect overly self-reflective and self-conscious than it was when they did it previously. Mm. <clears throat> okay, let's have a look at the term ego. I think that the term yeah. ego is is amazingly misunderstood. Yeah. So when you, for example, read Sigmund Freud, um, he says that the ego of the child must not be injured. Yeah. So he actually says as a that an injured ego, a an injured ego is a pathological state. Yeah. So when you look into a Sankhya philosophy, you will see that um, what we call ego is called ahankara. That means eye maker. Yeah. And so the ego is ultimately a piece of software which connects your body and mind. Yeah. And so you notice that I had a couple of mates uh, when I was young, they took too much acid and chemically deleted their ego and deleted the software that attached their body and their mind firmly to each other. And then they suffered from multi-personality disorder, schizophrenia. Yeah. That's an injuring of the ego. Mm -hmm. So this this thing that um, spiritual people often say, oh, you have to drop your ego. Yeah, you have to yeah, be a yeah. bit more precise with language. Yeah? yeah. When you study Patanjali, in uh, Patanjali uses the term asmita. Yeah. You can translate that as uh, uh, I amness or as egotism. Now Patanjali uses it with two different meanings. First is, asmita is one of the kleshas, yeah? There mm -hmm. is yeah. amitya, asmita, raga, dvesha, vinivesha, klesha, mm -hmm. That is, the five modes of suffering are ignorance, yeah. egotism, there it is, uh, desire, aversion, and fear of death, yeah? But then mysteriously, he brings the same term again for the fifth of the eight samadhis. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the sixth. It's called Asmita Samadhi, yeah? How so? Yeah? And so the, the, the mystery, um, uh, so um, ego in Patanjali's parlance is called Asmita, that is um, I amness or sense of I. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, in the Sankhya, it's ahankara. Now, aham, or I, mm -hmm. is actually the first and the last letter of the Sanskrit alphabet. Yeah? And so, you know, remember also that when good old Moses stood on the mountain and Jave told him, go and go to the Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses said, well, if the Pharaoh asks me who sent me, what should I say? Yeah, good question. Yeah. And so Javed sent, uh, told him, tell him my name is I am that I am. Yeah, what that means is cosmic I amness. Yeah, so in other words, when you look at, the way how the term ahankara is used in Sanskrit, it's uh, 
the I thought that comes out of cosmic intelligence. And so what in our spiritual language, when we say to somebody, <clears throat> you have a big ego, mm -hmm. drop your ego. Yeah. What we actually mean is that person has a mutative ego. Yeah. So they are saying about themselves, I am better and greater than you. Yeah. And they probably say that because deep down they believe that they're right the opposite. Yeah. 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 That's a pathological state. But to I say it... I but to say I am is what Patanjali ultimately it is what Patanjali calls Asmita Samadhi. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Where you, it's uh, asmita samadhi means individuation samadhi, yeah, and individuation samadhi. Sorry to get carried away, but no, it no, means no. that um, you become aware that your individuation is nothing but a conduit through which divine intelligence flows through. That's asmita samadhi, yeah. So, in other words, when we talk about ego. We need to differentiate between um, a piece of software that limits the divine to be limited in time and space, and it does that through you, through mm -hmm. each individual. That's why it's called individuation samadhi. And so the samadhi is really to realize that I am not I, but I'm, I'm not a selfish gene-powered flesh yeah. robot, but I'm, but I'm actually... Cosmic intelligence individuating itself by limiting itself in space and time. That's me. I suppose, but also to work on actually approaching the ego rather than just kind of denying it because it's kind of uncomfortable or, you know, a difficult subject, right? It's easy to kind of say, when well, we're going to let go of my ego, you know, because it's problematic rather than kind yeah. of like, you know, work to adjusting it to some degree. I think that, yeah, as you say, the two things, the problematic ego and spirituality get confused. And yes. especially, I think, in the West, when we have so many problems with the ego, the totally, ego totally. becomes confused with the spiritual journey. And they're two different things, totally. you know. Um, totally, yeah. absolutely, yes, yeah. I think, you know, it's important to recognize that you need to, first of all, make the ego relatively healthy, normalize it to some degree, and then continue with the spiritual work, you know. Yes, that's right. Yeah, if it yeah. becomes pathological, then then you have a, you do have a psychological issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. Well, that was kind of heavy. Um, <laughs> let's like. <laughs> I mean, I think I've seen you do a double interview before, but I won't inject you to that today. But I might come back to you again at some point. I hope. Um, but just to lighten up a bit, um, drawing towards the conclusion today. Uh, what what do you, what kind of practice do you do today and how important, I know you're very interested in pranayama, how important is it to um, include the pranayama with the asana practice? And when do you do that for students? Well, so Krishnamacharya thought that pranayama was more important than the asana practice. Yeah. So now, he didn't mean that to, to, he didn't say that to mean that you shouldn't do your asana practice. But what it is, is your asana practice is a preparation for panayama. And in your panayama, you're doing a real big part of the actual yogic work. Krishnamacharya said, panayama is um, instrumental to, in reaching samadhi. Instrumental for using, reaching samadhi. And so Krishnamacharya, in his final you know, 20 years or so, he practiced asana twice and pranayama three times per day. Yeah? Because he was between 80 and 100 and he, he was retired. Yeah? yeah, right. And then it was sort of like, hooray, let's go for it. Yeah? I'm not quite at that state yet, but so I do still practice, um, um, you know, one and a half hours of asana per day. Do you? But yes, I do. And, and mm. I, I would assume that I do that until I kick the bucket. Right. Do you yeah, do like Pranayama in intermediate series or do you do a variation yeah. of those? Or? Yeah, like. it's sort of like, it's sometimes at the moment I'm doing more intermediate again. So 
I used to do third. I'm not doing that anymore. There right. is sort of a couple of things happened in my life where I got sort of like snapped out of it. But I did third until about my 50th birthday. Did you? Right. Yeah, I did. And uh, yeah, sometimes I regret that I stopped it. But um, it, it's sort of a couple of things happened simultaneously in my life. One is that I started to travel and teach a real lot. Mm-hmm. And sort of another thing that happened was that I understood that I need to invest much more time and energy in my spirituality. So I do practice um, four and a half hours a day in total, which is uh, I first in the morning I get up, I do my Nauli, and then I do a, a long session with, with um, a meditation, chakra and kundalini meditation, which ultimately merges into samadhi practice. And then... Uh, I have a tea break and then I do my asana practice and from there I go into my Kapalabhati and Bastika and Nadi Shodana, my Pranayama practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, so four and a half hours. Uh, disclaimer here. My wife says, she keeps me honest. She says, you tell your students you're practicing four and a half hours, but the truth is you're actually far assing around a lot of the time. <laughs> So here I am, I'm disclosing the fact, so maybe I'm getting a bit old and lazy in between. So a few hours tinkering around the house, and and, and you call that yoga, having a coffee. Think. Yeah, yeah, tea, yeah, actually. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, really having tea, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm really into so you do that, you do that first thing in the morning, you know, all through, yes. you kind of, you know, all with through. a few little procrastinations. Yes. Yeah, checking your Instagram, and then back onto it. Yeah. <laughs> joking there yeah um, yeah more or less yeah 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 right that's i mean that's that's still a long that's still a long practice isn't it? And, yeah uh, but how, you know, and, it's like i don't do that from a feeling like oh shit i have to yeah like yeah begrudgingly yeah. but it's because i want to you know it's an amazing mm. privilege to be able to do that you know mm, mm. so i feel like blessed that i have the time that I can actually do that. And I had to work a real long time to get to that point, to have that much space in my life, you know. It's more yeah. privileged. Yeah. Um, I, people are increasingly interested in the pranayamas as well. I think um, yes. we didn't really have that. You know, I don't think that, I definitely didn't have that experience in early Ashtanga, right? That people, we didn't really get, I mean, it was the idea that if you were an advanced student, you would be taught, in my store, the pranayamas, mm. but there weren't many people teaching it and there wasn't the emphasis mm-hmm. that it is now or the interest, I think. A lot of students are really interested in pranayama now. Do you recommend mm. they start alongside their asana practice? And what would they what would they start with? Um, so in the Hatha Yoga Deepika, there is a sentence which has been totally misunderstood and Krishnamacharya actually specified that, what it means. People have understood that when you have reached perfection in asana, <coughs> you start pranayama. That sentence says, mentions asana in the singular. That means when you have per- reached perfection in an asana. Yeah? That means when you have a sitting asana that is good enough that you can sit your pranayama practice in that posture, then you do pranayama. That's it. Right. Yeah, so the you can you steady start, enough. Yeah, you can do anyway. pranayama mm-hmm. in virasana, for example. You don't need to sit right. right until you can do padmasana. Yeah? yeah, you can do virasana or arasidasana, swastikasana, any of those postures. But the most important thing is that people have a desire. You know, if somebody comes to me and they say, "I want to do pranayama," um, I'll just instruct them how to sit properly, yeah? If necessary, we have to put them up on a bolster or something like that. Right. And then we start basic pranayama, right? Yeah. Uh, what that is that? You start, that is, you start with kapalabhati. Really? Yeah. Hmm. But you got to do it really well. You can make a lot of mistakes. You know, I have written a textbook on pranayama. And you can do a lot of mistakes. You got to do it well. Your exhalation has to be four times as fast than the inhalation. Otherwise, it's not Kapalabhati. Yeah, it must be four to one rhythm. And the Kapalabhati must be low down below the navel only. Otherwise, Where do you start with Kapalabhati? 
Why do you start there? Because a lot of people will teach um, alternate nostril breathing, Nadi Shona. Um, because you, your slow breathing pranayama should be preceded by a rapid breathing pranayama, such as Kapalabhati, because nice. otherwise it'll take you too long to succeed. That means use the Kapalabhati as a pranic supercharger, right? right. We but you know, the Nadi bit. Shudi, yeah, mm, the Nadi yeah. Shudi is really important. It's an excellent technique. But don't start it with Kumbhaka. No Kumbhakas. No Kumbhakas. No Kumbhakas. Yeah. Because there is an ancient text, it's the Vasishta Samhita, yeah, Yeah. written by the Rishi Vasishta, in which he says, who does Kumbhakas before having mastered Nadi Shudi, ultimate nostril breathing, is an idiot. (laughs) Yeah. Was that the exact terminology? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, mudha. It's, it's called good, mudha. Right. Yeah, it's <laughs> mudha. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. This note, Vasishta said that, not me. You know, I right. would never say such a thing. <laughs> I've only quoted one of the ancient sages. <laughs> there you go, curse in Sanskrit. There you go. Um, well, I'm, I'm hoping some some point to um, pick your great brain some more on the uh, on the pranayama and um, potentially um, even uh, get you teaching it for us. But um, just for now, yeah. uh, I'm going to have to wrap up. I've taken a little, too much of your time already. I'm sure you've got a few more hours of practice to do. Um, <laughs> well, um, just just uh, <laughs> just to humanise you, um, what what um what kind of stuff do you get up to outside yoga when you uh, you know what are, you know what are your pastimes? What, do, what what other stuff do you do? Do you do anything at all? Yeah, look, um, we live in the middle of the jungle. Uh, on the Australian East Coast in the rainforest. So I'm sort of a bush ranger, more or less, you know. Right. We have 150 acre property. There's a lot of work, you know. Sometimes there is trees falling over. I get my huge chainsaw out and then maybe get the jackhammer out to plant a tree or something like that. So there's a bit of that. And then I'm also like an, you could say, an education junkie. I'm constantly studying, you know. I'm studying anthropology, evolutionary biology, um, psychology, quantum physics. I'm just, I'm sort of so fascinated, you know, by learning, by understanding things, yeah? This is sort of a good thing that comes with yoga. You're sort of like, wow, my brain is actually working, you know? I used to, I I was classified as learning disabled when I was young. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, it was an amazing awakening to sort of like de- develop a, um, a photographic memory. Disclaimer, <laughs> my wife says, you tell your students you have a photographic memory, but you, never, <laughs> you don't remember what I told you to do. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> well, um, I always, I won't end on that note. I'm just gonna have one, more, one more question. Um, who is, who or what inspires you, apart from um, apart from learning? Um, look, uh, my favorite sages. I sort of got some Indian sages that I find really uh, amazing. Of course, uh, Paramahamsa Ramakrishna would be one of them. Yeah, Sri Aurobindo, Tralanga Swami. Yeah. So, yeah, they would be some of them. What about in the saga data? Um, yes, pretty good. Um, it's for me too non dualistic, right? Okay, yeah, so that means there is too little interest in the world, right? Yeah, I'll, gi- yeah. I'll get you the, in- the you know, like for example, um. Uh, with Nisargadatta, it's like, it's always like, it's the same with Ramana Maharishi, you're rising above the human condition. Yeah. right. Yeah? Mm. Whereas Sri Aurobindo gave us this concept of horizontal yoga, yeah? That is everything that you do is always in the service of uh, any uh, realization, any uh, uh, must always be embodied in service of other people, yeah, in service of other beings. Yeah, that's why I, I like that line of inquiry. 
Well, I think we've done about an hour. Um, I'm as so often. I'm you know I'm really enjoyed this, and uh, I thank you for joining us. Um, Thanks so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Thank Looking you. forward to it. Yeah. All the best. We'll be in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.